Section four of Science History of the Universe, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Science History of the Universe, Volume two. Edited by Francis Walt Wheeler. Geology. Chapter two. The Beginnings of Cartography. Part two. While Hanno was thus exploring the western coast of Africa, another Carthaginian named Himlikon was sent by his countrymen to the north of Europe. From a very vague description of his voyage, given in a Latin poem entitled Ora Maritima, it is plain that he crossed the Bay of Biscay and found upon islands, as is asserted, but probably upon the mainland, a race of athletic people who went fearlessly to sea in barks made of skins sewed together. They crossed, in the space of two days, to a place called the Sacred Island, Ireland, which is not far from another island named Albion, England. No further details of this expedition have been preserved. A colony which had been established at Massilia, now Marseille, about 600 years before Christ by the Phoenicians was, in the year 340 BC, at the height of its commercial prosperity. The citizens, being desirous of extending their maritime relations, sent at this period upon an expedition to the north of Europe, through the Pillars of Hercules, a learned geographer and astronomer by the name of Pythias. He started with a single ship. He passed the Pillars on the 16th day from Massilia, and on the twentieth day he arrived at the sacred promontory, the extreme western point of Iberia or Spain. A temple to Hercules had been erected at this spot. The inhabitants of the promontory declared during the time of Pythias, and indeed for two hundred years afterwards, that as the sun plunged at evening into the sea they heard a hissing like that of a red-hot body suddenly dropped into water. Following the coasts of Iberia and of Celtica, he came to the point of land now known as Finisterra in France and the promontory Calbium. Turning east, he was surprised to find himself in a wide gulf, with Celtica on his right and an immense island on his left. The gulf was the British Channel, and the island, the Albion, that Himlikon had vaguely described some centuries before. It was at this point that Pythias may be said to have begun his career and the discovery of Great Britain may safely be attributed to him. He described the island as having the form of an isosceles triangle. Three promontories formed the three right angles. Valerium, being now Land's End, Cantinum, Cape Pepernus, and Orcus, Duncan's Head. He found the inhabitants of the southern coast industrious and sociable, peaceable, honest, and sober. They raised wheat and worked rich mines of tin. As he sailed northward along the eastern coast, he noted that the days grew sensibly longer, and at Point Orcas nineteen hours elapsed between the rising and setting of the sun. He sailed still northward, and six days after leaving Orcas, he came to an island or continent, he knew not which, which he called Thule. As he found he could go no further to the north, he spoke of the spot as Ultima Thule, an expression which has passed into the figurative language of all modern nations as one denoting any remote point. Thule is generally considered to have been Shetland, although theories have been ardently advocated, making it respectively Iceland, Sweden, and Jutland. The narrative of Pythias, which has been thus far clear and reliable, assumes at this point a fabulous aspect. He declares that north of Thule there was neither earth nor sea, nor air, a sort of dense concretion of all the elements occupied space and enveloped the world. He compared it to the thick, viscid animal substance called pulo marinus, a sort of mollusk or medusa. He said that this substance was the basis of the universe, and that in it earth, air, and sky hung, as it were, suspended. This illusion has been explained by the dreary spectacle of fogs, mists, rains, and tempests, which at this point of his voyage must have met the gaze of the daring navigator. 
it would have been difficult for any mind in those early ages to have been on its guard against the sinister impressions likely to result from the contemplation of a scene so appalling it must be remembered that pythias was accustomed to the pure and transparent atmosphere the dazzling sky and the phosphorescent waters of the mediterranean it would have been astonishing if a man educated among the splendors of an almost tropical climate had not been oppressed by influences so gloomy in the year 863 a dane of swedish origin named garter adventurously pushed off into the northern ocean discovered the rock island whose appropriate name is iceland eleven years later a navigator named ingolf colonized the country the colonists many of whom belonged to the most esteemed families in the north establishing a flourishing republic in 877 a sailor named gunbjorn saw a mountainous coast far to the west supposed to be now concealed or rendered inaccessible by the descent of arctic ice eric the red who had been banished from norway for murder and had settled in iceland was in his turn outlawed thence in 983 he sailed to the west and discovered a land which he called greenland because as he said people will be attracted hither if the land has a good name he returned to iceland and in the year 985 a large number of ships according to some authorities 35 followed him to the new settlement and established themselves on its southwestern shore in 986 bjarni herjolfsson bjarni son of herjulf in a voyage from Iceland to Greenland, was driven a long distance from the accustomed track. Various data furnished by this narrative in the original Iceland records have enabled geographers to determine the various coasts dimly seen by Bjarni, but upon which he did not land. They are supposed to have been those of Long Island, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland. In the year 994, Leif Erikson, Leif, the son of Eric the outlaw, bought Bjarni's ship and engaged thirty-five men to navigate it, as he intended to sail upon a voyage of discovery. He asked his father, Eric, to be the captain, but Eric declined, being, as he said, well stricken in years. They sailed away into the sea and discovered first the land which Bjarni had discovered last. They went ashore, saw no grass but plenty of icebergs and an abundance of flat stones. From the latter circumstance they named the place Heluland, Helu signifying a flat stone. There can be no doubt that the spot thus named is the modern Newfoundland. They went on board again and proceeded on their way. They went ashore a second time, where the land was flat and covered with wood and white sand. This, said Leif, shall be named after its qualities and called Markland, Woodland. Again embarking and sailing to the south, they reached Vinland, so called because of the wild grapes this was probably the first recorded landing on the eastern shore of what is now the united states thus beginning from a fearful restraint of venturing upon the sea the ancients first explored the mediterranean then growing bolder ventured beyond the straits of gibraltar and crept along the african coast and up toward the north of europe the perils of the open ocean were first dared by the norsemen to whom is due the honor of having first landed upon and truly discovered the continent of america an honor furthered by columbus amerigo vespucci and later navigators the next great event was the doubling of the cape of good hope by bartholomew diaz in 1486 he had indeed doubled it without knowing it for having taken a wide sweep to sea after a long southern voyage and on again making for the land he could find none only on turning to a more northerly course did he see land one hundred miles to the eastward of the formidable cape which never before had been passed it avails little to tell the voyage of columbus and his discovery of the west indies in fourteen ninety two or the curious circumstances which led to the use of amerigo's name the florentines were eager to have amerigo's work recognized and when a frenchman of saint -Dee, republished his narrative making an error in the date which made it seem that amerigo preceded columbus florence took it up and spain made no protest in favor of columbus whom she had allowed to die in punery and disgrace sebastian cabot a true navigator discovered hudson's bay in fifteen eighteen vasco da gama in fourteen ninety seven followed the track of bartholomew diaz and reached india by doubling the cape of good hope 
it did not occur to him however to continue his journey and in returning to portugal he retraced his path in fifteen nineteen ferdinand magellan found the straits between the atlantic and the pacific which are known as the magellan straits to this day with the atlantic and the pacific thus laid open navigators followed close upon each other's heels and scarce a year passed that did not see some portion of ocean crossed or some new point of coastline chartered the circumnavigation of the world speedily became a matter of no comment and the once appalling ocean became as familiar a highway as a city street exploration in the true sense of the word thereafter was mainly devoted to land expeditions which were of great physiographical benefit when the large continents were first crossed thus the spaniards in the south of north america and in mexico and peru added vastly to the world's knowledge likewise in africa the names of such men as mungo park speak grant livingston and stanley are to be remembered and in australia the first man to cross the continent john mcdowell stewart in 1862 but modern exploration has been devoted mainly to polar search and now that late in the summer of 1909 the announcement is made that the north pole has been reached and lieutenant perry has brought back the records of his valuable trip it may be well to point out the northward progress of successor polar expeditions in the reign of henry the eighth dr robert thorne declared that if he had faculty to his will the first thing he would understand even to attempt would be if our seas northward are navigable to the pole or no accordingly two fair ships set forth on may fifteen twenty seven one was wrecked off newfoundland the other does not seem to have returned a similar fate met sir hugh willoughby who left in fifteen sixty three who lost one vessel on the muscovy coast and who with all his companions perished miserably in lapland martin forbisher the great navigator reached latitude sixty three degrees as his most northerly point and in fifteen eighty five captain john davis reached latitude eighty degrees and on a third voyage pushed even farther reaching a point he named cape sanderson henry hudson the explorer of the hudson river whose tricennial discovery of the hudson river coupled with the celebration of robert fulton in september and october nineteen o nine brought representatives to new york from all civilized countries to do them honor was also one of the furthest north men in sixteen o seven in an attempt to reach the pacific by the long-sought northwest passage he attained the latitude of eighty one degrees the last of the early explorers was william baffin who with robert bylot in 1615 sailed around greenland giving his name to baffin bay the nineteenth century was remarkable for strenuous endeavor in 1818 sir john perry overtopped all earlier efforts and reached as far north as 82 degrees the hopes of the world however rose high when in the spring of 1845 sir john franklin sailed for polar waters the silence of the arctic winter fell over the expedition and rescue parties later found the bodies of franklin and his men who had died in forwarding their quest scarcely less tragic was the loss of the american de long expedition in 1881 the great figure in polar work during the nineteenth century unquestionably was commander robert e perry who in 1886 first attacked the arctic terrors his first expedition was to greenland and from that time he has been almost constantly in the arctic region under the auspices of several learned and scientific societies but in spite of his indefatigable efforts a norwegian dr nansen carried off the banner for the highest point reached in the nineteenth century he built a vessel to withstand ice pressure and trusted that the currents would carry him to the pole he reached latitude eighty six degrees fourteen minutes and brought back a mass of extremely useful scientific information an attempt to reach the north pole by balloon was made by professor andre in eighteen ninety seven the expedition was never heard from for aerial navigation had not then made the wonderful advances compassed in the first decade of the twentieth century the last year of the century saw the northern mark again pushed forward an expedition under the command of the duke of abruzzi sailed in eighteen ninety nine 
Dr. Nansen's furthest point was passed, and a dash was being made for the pole, when the leader of the expedition was severely frostbitten, and he transferred the command to Captain Cagney, who reached the point of latitude 86 degrees 34 minutes. Two important Arctic expeditions may be mentioned. The Ziegler expedition commanded by Anthony Fiala in 1903, and that of Captain Admundsen. Fiala spent two years above the 81st parallel, and added greatly to polar knowledge, and Admundsen achieved the long-sought feat of the Northwest Passage in the little ship Goa. Early in September 1909, Dr. Frederick A. Cook cabled news that he had reached the North Pole. The unexpectedness of the report and the fact that the traveler was known to be far less elaborately equipped than most polar explorers caused the news at first to be received with a great deal of hesitation in scientific circles. Far other was the reception accorded the news received a week later that Lieutenant Perry had reached the pole, touching the coveted spot on April 6, 1909. The priority of Dr. Cook's claim, duly substantiated, would be indisputable, but would be of less scientific value by reason of the less adequate facilities he possessed for meteorological, geographical, and astronomical observations. Whether first by Dr. Cook or by Lieutenant Perry, two facts stand out clearly high above all the rest, that the North Pole has been reached and that the first flag to fly there was the Stars and Stripes. But one quest remains for the explorer, the South Pole, and the year 1909 is as memorable in Antarctic as in Arctic discovery. In one of the finest ice journeys ever made, Lieutenant E. H. Shackleton of the British Navy planted the Union Jack at 88 degrees 23 minutes south, or but 111 miles from the South Pole, the flag being hoisted on January 9, 1909. Thus, in the same year, an American and an Englishman stood almost at the two poles of the earth, practically completing the exploration of the world. End of chapter 2